Good morning and welcome to worship. The Lord calls us to worship today from the Psalms. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Let's stand and do just that as we sing, Love divine, all love is excelling. opportunity to come together as the people of God and the house of the Lord to worship the risen Christ. Amen? Amen? On most Sunday mornings before worship, I'm going around, you know, shaking hands, hugging necks, kissing babies, whatever the situation dictates. Uh, but this morning, I did not get to do that because of today's baptism. So if you are a guest with us today, we want to... We want to let you know how welcome you are. Uh, we'd love to get some more information from you. Uh, I'll actually be in the Welcome Center after worship today. I'd love to get to know you uh, by name, but welcome to worship with the people of God, redeemed by grace through faith in the Son of God, to worship for the glory of God today. What a special opportunity we have to start worship with baptism. Uh, we have three young men and women uh, who came to faith in Christ during VBS, uh, and sent your kid following after that. Uh, so what a way to start worship today. First, we have Miss Lucy Manus. Big step up. Lucy, 
Do you confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord, crucified for your sins and raised on the third day? Then as your pastor and as a minister of the gospel, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. And next we have her brother, Jace. This is my very first Jace to get to baptize. I have a son named Jace. But when he uh, came to faith in Christ, his granddaddy, granddaddy thought he could do a better job, so he did it. So, Jace, this is special for me. Jace, do you confess faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, crucified for your sins and raised on the third day? Yes. Then as your pastor and as a minister of the gospel, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen and amen. And last this morning, we have Miss Danny Taylor. Danny came to faith in Christ. Uh, she's been, oh, you're good. You don't need the. I've got you if you do. Uh, Danny uh, has been, God's been working in her heart for the better part of a year. Uh, and when we went to Century Kid this year, God uh, ordained that as the moment of her salvation. She came to place her faith in Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord and follows through with obedient baptism today. Danny, do you confess faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, crucified for your sins and raised on the third day? Then as your pastor and as a minister of the gospel, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Growing up, my father was my pastor and he closed out baptism the same way every time by reminding all those present, if you've not let, yet placed your faith in Jesus, Still, there is room for you. Let me pray for us this morning. God, we celebrate so strongly what these waters represent. That when you find us stained by sin, rather than discard us, you wash us whiter than snow. You make us new. You give us salvation as a free gift because Jesus Christ has paid for it in full. Lord, I pray that everything we do in the time ahead as we worship you today would be a response to what you have already done in your Son and what you are still doing by the power of your Spirit and for the glory of your name. For it is in that matchless name that we pray. Amen. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died. To buy my pardon An empty grave is there to prove My Savior lives Let's join with Eric as we sing
can't swim lives. My rock, my savior, my joy, deliver my peace because he lives. My rock, my healer, my strength. with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, as we start a new sermon series today, Bodybuilders. Um, some of you know some of the, the crazy CrossFitters in our church, uh, Kidnapped me a couple of weeks ago, and I've been, I've been ex working out, exercising with them. Um, I promise this sermon series is not about that. that that's more of body breakers. Um, uh, for the next several weeks, 
Uh, we'll be looking at a sermon series called Bodybuilders. Uh, we live in such a highly individualistic society that it is so easy to forget that again and again and again, the Bible calls us to live out our personal relationship with Jesus on an interpersonal level. And one of the most common images that comes up as you work through the New Testament to capture how this works is the image of God's people as the body of Christ. So this series for the next several weeks will be about how each of us through the saving work of Jesus and the sanctifying work of the Spirit can do our part to build up that body. If you have Colossians 3, 1 through 4, follow along as I read God's word for us aloud this morning. And Paul says, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Uh, when I was a kid, I'll never forget, my dad loved astronaut movies. I remember watching The Right Stuff. Anybody? Yeah. Got the Oscar for Best Picture back in the day. Uh, I remember watching The Right Stuff. I think it came out in 1981. I wasn't around then, so I watched it later. Uh, I watched the right stuff with my dad. I remember when I was in third or fourth grade going to see Apollo 13. Um, and there's just something, and I remember watching Star Wars movies. There's just something fascinating about space. But I wasn't going to be a Jedi, so I wanted to be an astronaut. There's just one problem. It's very, very hard to be an astronaut. It is an extremely selective and competitive progress. Uh, the last year for which I could find comprehensive data was 2017. In 2017, 18,300 people, and then some, applied to NASA's astronaut training program. 12 were selected out of 18,300. And it's not guys like me who are applying. Of those who thought they had the right stuff to be an astronaut, 18,300 plus people applied and only 12 were selected. Applicants to the astronaut training program must be highly intelligent and educated. Upon acceptance into the program, a two-year basic training course is required uh, during which they endure this grueling battery of physical training. Oh, so maybe there is CrossFit. They earn their scuba certification and they have to swim three laps in a pool while wearing a flight suit. They undergo military land and water survival training, which is essential for emergencies. Between education requirements and program training, the process of becoming an astronaut, even if you are selected, takes a minimum of about 10 years. And so to become an astronaut, you have to have more than what we would call the right stuff. You have to narrow your focus. You have to be singularly driven by this goal and desire. You almost have to be selfish about the rest of your life so you can throw all of yourself into this one part of your life. But what's so fascinating is that for those who do make it to space, for those who do get to see Earth as the pale blue dot, an almost instant transformation takes place. A team of psychologists has studied the effects of outer space on inner space uh, by studying more than a hundred astronauts and cosmonauts through interviews, surveys, and uh, analyses of their various autobiographies. And what's amazing is that astronauts, upon returning from space, these very intelligent very well trained, very driven, almost selfish in their singular pursuit of seeing the world from up there. These very driven people upon returning from space have a much broader global consciousness 
Psychologists call this the overview effect. In fact, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell talked about it this way. He said, you develop an instant global consciousness, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. These are people who have trained more than a decade of their life to see the world from up there. But if they get to see the world from up there, it instantly transforms how they engage the world down here. Isn't that interesting? These people who wanted to go so high into space upon reaching that height lower themselves to serve others. And I think that's such a great illustration as we kick off this sermon series because I would argue biblically that in a sense, our altitude affects our attitude. Our perception on things, on, on what we do with life, on how we relate to people in life, communicates a great deal about the perspective from which we view these things. We are tempted in life to view all aspects of life as a pyramid with everyone trying to get to the top and the people uh, racing to the top alongside you as your competition. And the higher we climb, whether in position, whether in finances, whether in relationships, the smarter, stronger, more talented, beautiful, handsome, special, and worthy we must be. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is not about a God who waits impatiently at the top to grant approval to a select few who make it so high. The gospel is about a God who in the fullness of time lowers himself, coming down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul captures in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, especially 5 through 8. He says, have the same mindset, have the same perspective, the same way of thinking that was in Christ Jesus, even though he was God in his very nature. You don't get a higher perspective than that. Astronauts got nothing on God for perspective. Even though he was God in his very nature, he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. But he emptied himself or lowered himself or deprived himself of power, your translation may say, taking on the form of a servant and being found in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he further humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You want the ultimate example of the overview effect? If an astronaut can see the world from space and excitedly return to earth to engage and serve his fellow man. What does it tell us about the gospel that no one gets a higher perspective than God? There's no one sovereign above the Lord. There's no one wiser than the Lord. There's no one more powerful than Almighty God. And yet he demonstrates good news, not just by what he reveals up there, but in what he does in coming down here. That's the gospel. Paul captures this in the passages leading up to today's passage. In Colossians 1, 21 following, he said, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy faultless and blameless before him. Paul continues in the next chapter. He says, And you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with his obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Don't miss this. He says you were not, we, we, we often say the world is lost and dying apart from Christ. The Bible uses far stronger language. 
The Bible says, apart from Christ, you were dead already. What, what did Jesus do when he left the worship and praise and honor and celebration of his eternal name and glory to come down to the world to live a sinless life? to die a perfect death, to go into the tomb. What was he doing? He was willing to go to his grave in order to rescue you from yours. You were dead, but you are alive in Christ. That's what Paul is talking about in today's passage. Set your mind on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. For Paul, Jesus is not an astronaut applicant. He's not one of 18,300 plus that we're looking to deem worthy, that we're trying to find a spot for. For him, he's not one in a few. For him, Jesus is the one and only the perfect Son of God, the only person in all human history who is deemed worthy to be a sufficient sacrifice for my sin and yours, the only one in all of history deemed sufficient to be Savior for the whole world. God proved this by raising him from the dead, by exalting him to his right hand. I love the way that Hebrews captured this. Um, it says, since then we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside uh, every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Beard this morning. And let us run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes. I'm going to stay on pulpit, Mike. Let us run the race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him. It doesn't say Jesus enjoyed the cross. It said Jesus did what? Endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God. Jesus knew exactly how far he had to lower himself to raise us up. And he willingly did it. And if we think that that mindset is a good idea for Jesus, then maybe, just maybe, that mindset should be more of a default. The way that Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith uh, captures this in his book, You Are What You Love. He said, worship works from the top down, you might say. In worship, we don't just come to show God our devotion and give him our praise. We are called to worship because in this encounter, God remakes and molds us top down. Worship is the arena in which God recalibrates our hearts, reforms our desires, and rehabituates our loves. Worship isn't just something we do. It is where God does something to us. Worship is the heart of discipleship because it is the gymnasium in which God retrains our hearts. In other words, when we come here on a Sunday morning to worship God together, it is absolutely to lift high the matchless name of Jesus. Amen? But biblically, the better perspective we get on how highly exalted the matchless name of Jesus is, the better view we get on everything underneath it. When we view him above, we get a better perspective from above. When we see Christ, truly see Christ for who he is, for what he's done for us, if we attain so high a view, it transforms the way we see everything else below. I, I was thinking about this because sometimes it's the, the Bible almost seems like it has a non sequitur. So if you read the Bible, there's an incredible amount in the Bible um, about ministering to people. I forgot I turned it off. I need a leash. <laughs> Thank you. 
I pro that AV came from the camera crew, I promise. Um, it hurt that that got an amen. Uh, sometimes the Bible calls us to do things like help us, uh, help others who can't help us back, right? Acts of charity, acts of uh, benevolence, things like that. And then Jesus will turn around in his ministry and say, you know what? You will always have the poor with you. Wait, time out, Jesus. I thought I was solving a problem. You, you mean I'm just going to keep helping people who, 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 who are stuck in this situation? You mean, you mean I'm just going to keep helping people and I'm never going to get any closer to solving poverty at a global level? By the way, strategies for solving poverty at the global level abound. So far, 0% successful. Maybe Jesus knew what he talked about when he said, you will always have the poor with you. Fair? But Jesus, if I'll always have the poor with me, why do you keep telling me that I need to minister to the poor? I'm not accomplishing anything. And then it finally clicked for me. Maybe the ministry of charity, maybe the ministry of benevolence, maybe being gracious with my time, my ability, my resources isn't just about transforming something in someone else. Maybe it's part of God's ordained means for transforming something in me. Maybe when I relate to others the way that God has related to me in Jesus Christ, this is precisely the means he uses by the power of his spirit. Not just to give me a better view of them, but to give me a deeper appreciation of him. You want another example that we don't get defensive about at all? Loving on a baby. I celebrated, some of you uh, follow me on Facebook, I celebrated at the end of this week, Mackenzie finally said dada. Finally. Amen. And it was so endearing and it just made my day. It did hurt a little bit that dada came after mama Bubba's, which is brothers, breakfast, you think I'm crazy, but she said it one time and Haley was there as a second witness, and poo-poo. <laughs> but my heart melted when she said dada. Let me tell you something, Mackenzie and I do not have a mutualistic relationship. We do all sorts of things for Mackenzie that she can't do for us, right? Uh, we, we help her in all sorts of ways and we're not keeping a tally like, oh my gosh, another diaper. Oh my gosh, another bottle. I have zipped and unsnipped out of that little, uh, zipped and unzipped out of that sleeping sack so many times. That's not how it works. In, instinctively, we're, we're willing to give babies that kind of love, right? What if God uses things like that, not just for our family, but for his world? To help us understand what he's done for us as we do like that for others. You will always have the poor with you because your ministry to the poor isn't just about changing them. Your ministry to the poor is part of God's ordained means of changing you. That's how God cultivates in you a higher perspective. When you minister, when you forgive, when you serve those who cannot serve you back in equal measure, you're not ultimately changing them. God's using that to change you, to give you a higher perspective on what he's already done and what he's going to do through your life. Look at how Paul flows from the set your mind on things above. In Colossians 3, 8 through 10, he says, But now put away all of the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. The more that we do those things, the less that we look like Him. And I say that we live in a polar, divisive time. Fair? 
It's very easy in our time to go from disapproving or even hating certain ideas to disapproving or hating the individuals who possess and communicate them. And may, may take inventory in your own life. God had to deal with me in this on a few things. Take inventory in your, in your own life. How often, when I, when I feel wronged, how often when someone comes up short, if someone doesn't carry their end of their relationship, how often is my first instinct to go to a place of anger, wrath, malice, slander? Well, they did that because they're this type of person. How often do we go there first instead of to what God did for us regardless of what type of person we are? Amen? We will miss our purpose if we miss God's perspective. How we see God affects how we see everything beneath him. And we will not serve people as Jesus did if we do not see people as Jesus does. So when Paul calls us to this higher perspective, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, instead... After you've taken off all those old things, instead, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against one another. You will hear me say this countless times through this sermon series. What holds the body of Christ together, what holds any family together, a marriage, parent-child, friendship, the body of Christ. What holds the body of Christ together is not the perpetual lack of offense. It is the priority of spirit-empowered forgiveness and reconciliation. What holds your relationship together with God is not that you suddenly became or ever will this side of eternity perfect. It's that every time I fall short, his grace is greater than my sin. And he prioritizes forgiving. He prioritizes reconciling. He prioritizes atoning. That's a King James word, to take two things that are separate and make them at one. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do in word or in deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him As I was preparing this series about building up the body of Christ, and some of you have heard me talk about this on a Wednesday night. As I was preparing this series on building up the body of Christ, I could not help but think about one of the most impacting people in my life. Um, her name is Cindy Barbara, and this time about a year ago, I was one of four ministers presiding at her memorial service. Uh, Cindy died shortly before she turned 60 years old. She lived the last 10 years of her life with Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, when I came to the church where Cindy was, I had been called to preach for some time, but I had not yet become a preacher. You appreciate that difference? And man, I really knew my stuff. I was, I was knocking out the seminary classes. But I had to be a preacher and God used this woman, woman in my life uh, one of the top five most spiritually impactful people in my life to speak truth to me and to show me a higher perspective not by always speaking to me up here but because I always saw her serving down here and I thought I knew until her funeral came I thought I knew a lot of what Cindy had done with her life I thought I knew a lot about how she had served others, but I was amazed by how many people at her funeral were brand new to me. Um, 
because ALS is it's a terrible disease. Um, first, it took her ability to walk. Over time, it took her ability to use her arms and her hands. In her last year and a half, uh, she required 24-7 assistance, uh, someone to feed her, someone to hold her phone. But she would still, she would still voice text people with her phone. She would still call people on her phone while someone else held it to encourage them. In fact, uh, 48 hours before she died was the last time I talked to her, and it's because she called me to pray for someone else. She did not say she was in her final moments. Um, it was amazing. At her funeral, there were, there were all these people from the North Shore ALS support groups, and some of them in equally bad shape, some of them in an earlier stage, and they all talked about there was a guy there who could not communicate. He had to do the Stephen Hawking thing where he looks at a computer screen to communicate. And we are weeping in her service as he's doing that slowly to tell about the impact that Cindy had in his life. A large segment of people there were people who are shut-ins. It is the first and only time at her service that they had been out since COVID started. And the reason that they risked it that day is because Cindy single-handedly ministered to all these people, dictating letters of encouragement or calling them on the phone. She didn't have the use of her legs. She didn't have the use of her hands. She barely had the use of her mouth. She struggled to breathe. And I was blown away because, man, I, when I saw her just withered and deteriorated by the terrible toll of ALS, she had every excuse to do nothing. But here's the beauty of the body of Christ. Hardship, struggle, disease, unfortunate circumstances, they can take away just about everything from you. But they never, ever took away her perspective. The beauty of Cindy's life is that even though she struggled through that terrible disease for 10 years, though it took about just about everything from her, even though it broke down her body systematically, there was never a time where she let it take her eyes off God being way up there and letting that perspective affect the way that she saw everything down here. I don't know what you're going through. I hope it's not that. But even in that, I know someone who knows Jesus well enough, who knows Jesus' place well enough to know what they should be doing with their life to their very last breath because of how, how, how seeing him affects how they see everything else. I ask myself, I'm terribly challenged by this. If not having her legs, if not having her arms, if barely having her mouth, if Cindy could do all of that with a body that was wasting away, how much could I, how much could we do with a body that is healthy? But that's not the real question. Because the body will never do what the body is equipped to do until the body starts with a view from above. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your mind on things above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Because I promise if we get a good look of Jesus up there, it will change the way we see and engage everything he came to do down here. And may God be glorified as we seek and serve him in doing so. Let's pray.
God, we love you because you first loved us. But God, help us respond to you not only in lifting up your name so high, but in going down and lowering ourselves to serve others as you did. To learn more about what Christ has done by living for Christ and living like Christ as we interact with others. God, give us your perspective on all things. Help us be a body of believers that encourages rather than criticizes, that forgives rather than writing each other off, that in every opportunity looks for an opportunity to show and share the gospel. And God, as we do that, we pray that your spirit would bind us together in mutual worship of your son and mutual sanctification through your spirit and mutual engagement of our community and the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and come as we sing. so much for being with us in worship this morning. Uh, as, a, as a means of follow-up, uh, I pray that we never abandon anyone on this side of the baptistry. Continue to pray for, serve alongside, encourage these young new believers that we baptize today. Continue to pray for Jason, Lucy, Manus, and Danny Taylor as the Lord grows them into the serving men and women that he would have them be in his church and for his world. By way of reminder, next Sunday we will have our first round of deacon nominations. You should have received those names this week as an add-on to your chimes. Uh, so we will have ballots uh, next Sunday for the first round of that. And we will follow through, continue praying for our youth minister search committee. And reminder, today is promotion Sunday, which means two things. One, our sixth graders are moving up to the youth department for the Sunday school. Actually, all of our kids are moving up, but the sixth graders are now going across the street to the Ruble House for our Sunday school hour. Uh, but also we have a time change with Sunday evening worship. Starting today, discipleship training will be at 5 p.m. and Sunday evening worship will be at 6 p.m. 
Uh, this fall, we're looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, so we invite you out to study that with us. Let me close our worship with a word of prayer, and God bless you as we go out in his name. God, we pray that you would lift our perspective so that we would voluntarily lower our lives, that the more that we think of Jesus, the more we humble ourselves as he did to serve others, to show that you can redeem anyone by grace through faith in your name. Help our lives be a living testimony to the gospel, not only as individuals, but together as your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless. Thank you.